Uh, welcome to Remember the Film, uh, the podcast where we talk about movies and all the things that make them memorable. So this week uh, we're talking about perhaps the most well-known filmmaker of all time, Steven Spielberg. Um, joining me this week are my usual co-hosts, I'm Hugo, and my usual co-hosts are Jeff Grizz Ulrich. Hello. And Josh Bradley. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> great intro. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. Doing pretty yeah. good. Yeah. New- yeah. Notre Dame's still undefeated. Notre Dame's still so undefeated. Great. That's always good for us. <laughs> and then... Uh... That'll, that'll be important later. Next week. Next week. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the new console, video game consoles came out, so it was actually a tough week for me to watch movies because I really wanted to be playing video games. <laughs> just, just don't. My pre-order is arriving maybe before Christmas because Italy, because <laughs> Italian GameStop allowed people to pre-order a month before you could pre-order. Yeah. So when I got there, you, I just couldn't get one. But anyway, yeah, uh, I'm still, you know, I'm on day 25 of quarantine. <laughs> All of my family got COVID and I managed somehow not to. So it, it's been a stressful time. But anyway, it's a good, it's good to have some time to talk about movies and not think about it every week. But anyway, I'll just give you guys a brief outline of the episode. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about our film to remember for this week, which is Sugarland Express. We'll get into that in a minute and then we'll talk about Steven Spielberg in general uh, our thoughts on the on the history of the director uh, and how he managed to be to to stay so relevant uh, through such a long career and finally we'll be revealing our shared top five of Spielberg movies at the end uh, but anyway wait. shall we just jump right into the film to remember which is Sugarland Express First of all, uh, yes. I think it was you guys' idea to, to, to pick this movie. Uh, and why did we pick it, Grizz? This is Steven Spielberg's first theatrical release. Uh, mm-hmm. And also the first movie that he had John Williams uh, doing the score for. And obviously, uh, as he was pretty well known, their friendship has lasted basically both of their careers ever since. So... <laughs> That it, it, yeah, forty plus years. It's a really important movie in that just with that connection alone, but then also just launching Steven Spielberg's career. Uh, you know, he was already well recognized from the few TV movies he had done uh, within the industry, uh, but this was, you know, the first breakout movie. Even if it wasn't a uh, cultural phenomenon uh among hollywood they it, it was well received and people could see that steven spielberg was going places <laughs> and it was the same producers as jaws so like spielberg convinced these producers to let him make this movie and then because this one did okay they're like okay let's give you jaws and see what you can do kid and <laughs> the rest is and, history i think and stuff happened after that <laughs> yes and yeah and i like that you said kids because how old was he when he directed this movie I want to say 24, probably. Yeah, he was young. 24, 25? He was, like, yeah. very young. I think he he was born in 46, so he was uh, 28 years old when he made this movie. So, yeah, he was which is four years crazy. younger than me. <laughs> yeah, four years older than me. He was my age when he made Duel, which is, in, I don't know, insane. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but wow. Just the, the, the types of shots that he managed to do you know, and everything it's its incredible but anyway uh, what did you guys think about Sugarland Express I'll start I uh, it's, I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it uh, I was telling Hugo before we started recording I, I live you know just a little over an hour from Sugarland Texas uh, hmm. so I've, I've been all over the areas that they, they were shooting in and granted a lot of it wasn't actually shot in Sugarland but I've driven all over Texas, you know, because I've lived here for my entire life. So it was, you know, it it kind of resonates with me just on a, a local, you know, level. Which I imagine people who live in L.A. every movie resonates with them on a local level. So this is it might... <laughs> depends, but yeah, basically, <laughs> first first opportunity for that sort of uh, attachment to a movie, and, and you know, I I don't talk like the people in the movie. Uh, and I would argue that most Texans don't actually talk like the people in the movie, but there's enough of them who do that I still felt it was pretty genuine. <laughs> but maybe, cool. but maybe in the yeah. smaller towns like Sugarland. Oh, for sure. Well, and yeah. I was also going to point out Sugarland uh, in the movie. You saw the population sign. It says like 3,700. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. way bigger. Sugarland's a pretty big city now. <laughs> right. Hmm. Well, that was you know a long time ago though. Yeah. What about you, Josh? 
Uh, I, th- I like this. This is good. Um, it, not my favorite Spielberg movie I've seen, but like considering it's like his first his first movie, um, I actually kind of get obsessive about watching director's first movies, and mm-hmm. this is a this is a very good one. Uh, speaking of which, Grizz, if you haven't seen Blood Simple, that's the Coen Brothers' first movie. It takes place in Texas. Uh, there we go. I'd be curious to know what you think I, about that I one. I should watch that. Uh, as a Texan. <laughs> uh, it's, I, was, it's... I was going to say that this movie was definitely something that inspired the sh- the, the, the Coen brothers. I know we, we keep coming back to them, but yes. there is a, so I, a certain Coen brother yeah. tone I mean, to this. We can get more into this later, but I was thinking um, one of my favorite like pre-1970s movies is Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. And uh, I also love the Coen brothers, so I love Raising Arizona. And you can draw a very clear line between Bonnie and Clyde and Sugarland Express, and then Absolutely. a different very clear line between Sugarland Express and Raising Arizona. And, like, Raising Arizona and Bonnie and Clyde don't have a whole lot to do with each other, but, like, with Sugarland Express kind of right in between them, you can kind of see that spectrum, which I thought was interesting. Um, but, yeah, this is really good. This is a good movie. Enjoyable. I think what one of the things that I liked uh, best about it is that there is a high enough level of humor to it that mm-hmm. in what is otherwise a very serious situation, obviously they're, you know, they've kidnapped a police officer fleeing from the police, you know, but there's still enough you know, lighthearted moments and humor in it that, you know, it's ha- an enjoyable experience all the way through. And I, I think that kind of, uh, you can see that in a lot of Spielberg's movies, uh, that even with the serious movies, he he works in just enough lightheartedness uh, to make them more palatable. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's interesting you say that. I think that, like, looking at this in the context of Spielberg and, like, looking for Spielberg touchstones in this, I think that how it approaches tone is definitely maybe the biggest one for me like there's a version of like this is a true story based on true events and we can do a plot summary in a second but like um there are ways to approach this real life story with a much different tone and much different approach to the characters uh i'm thinking about like natural born killers the tarantino script that Mm -hmm. oliver stone made in the 90s badlands or badlands yeah neither of those are very far off from this particularly Mm -hmm. natural born killers but it's a much 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 different attitude about its its main characters and and struggling express has a lot of sympathy for them and like very much emphasizes that they're not like bad people they're just like forced into a difficult situation and they're doing things that you or i probably wouldn't do but they're still like you know noble i guess is you know they're definitely not bright they're They're not smart people but (laughs) yes they're they're not yeah uh (laughs) you kind of get the sense that they're doing these they're breaking the law because of you know family motivations and also because they're not the brightest people but like that (laughs) that doesn't make them like bad yeah you know they're just not stable you know they have mental health issues it's yeah and and which leads well he's not a mental boy he's not a mental (laughs) but he's not a mental boy (laughs) yeah um yeah i think i thought it was pretty good uh considering it's a first movie in which well duel is his first movie technically but this is definitely the first movie where he had an actual uh story with characters I don't know if you've seen first Duel, the actual but, release, yeah, yeah, and it, but it, it's also the first movie where he where he, where he deals with with real characters with real character development, and I think mm-hmm. it, you can see the hallmarks of Spielberg in the sense that these characters are so lovable and so they feel real, even though it, in this movie in particular you don't get a lot of time for character development and and, and you know you don't get a lot of scenes yeah. in which they explain their motivations or it, you don't get a lot of emotional scenes. But, but you understand who these people are, you understand uh, what they want, and you sympathize with them, even if, you know, they're doing very, you know, they're doing crimes. Right. <laughs> they're criminals. But uh, you... A Spielberg, a, yeah. The, what Spielberg hallmark, I think, is Spielberg doesn't really make movies about bad people. No. Like, all of his characters are always at least trying their best, and, like, you can sympathize with them a little bit. Like, Spielberg would never make Wolf of Wall Street. Right. He would never make, like you know goodfellas like he doesn't scorsese and spielberg are like on two opposite ends of the spectrum of like he could know, but the he, morality of their characters he could make the same story but but those characters would end up being really likable <laughs> and he'd find the humanity in their actions even though they're doing exactly which is yeah. not always the point so that's yes. why you which know, is not yes it, I, I, i'm happy that for the most part they've done the movies that they've done respectively because they <laughs> uh they would be wildly different <laughs> stories had they been had the directors been flipped <laughs> Uh, let's go into this. let's go into spoilers though, Hugo, uh, yeah. real quick and do the plot summary. Yeah, so um, it's a really simple story. At the end of the day, it's based on a true story. Um, basically, these two uh, very young people who are parents and married, uh, and, and they were both in prison. 
an ex well she well, she yeah. she had just one ex con one left, current con <laughs> she was she's just left prison and he's still in in uh, it doesn't i'm not sure if it's it's exactly a prison or a sort of a rehabilitation facility of some sort it's a pre-release it looks facility. like there's a yeah oh okay okay that's that's some american thing that i don't understand <laughs> but <laughs> regardless of that basically she breaks him out and they decide together to go look for their child who was taken away from them and given to foster parents um but at the beginning they just want to go find him and take him to mexico but then the situation sort of um explodes in in their in front of them because they, they it wasn't their plan to, to to do what happened but they end up hijacking a police car with a police officer in it and it becomes a hostage situation and basically the whole movie is a very slow uh, car chase uh, which reminded me a bit of a blues brothers uh in it's which actually this, i really this... liked uh it was humorous to me that the movie is called the sugarland express and so yeah. you're expecting this to be a much faster paced thing going into it and, and i it actually really isn't, yeah. found it kind of funny how slow they're moving throughout the whole movie <laughs> And basically, it's the story of these two um, with this cop in their car uh, that basically have to get to Sugarland, where their child is in the foster family. And and they they sort of talk with the captain, Captain Tanner, uh, over the police radio. Uh, and they sort of bond with this police officer who at the, understands that they're not horrible people. They're just they're just not really stable. They've been through a lot. They Spielberg at some point at one point hints at, at, at some family drama that, that caused them to to sort of be the way that they are and act the way that they do, um, and which is at the end of the day he manages to make this a really endearing story even though they're criminals, uh, mm -hmm. but at the end it sort of goes wrong because they they don't manage to to understand that. Are we in spoilers? Yeah, we're in spoilers. Now? You can yeah, say, yeah, yeah. say whatever. At the end, you want. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it goes wrong because they don't understand that uh, the sheriff can't give them their child in exchange, in exchange for the police officer. And so what happens at the end is sort of he he doesn't want to, but at the end he has to uh, put snipers in the house uh, who shoot the father. Uh, yeah. And they eventually catch the mother and the police officer that they had kidnapped. Yep. Yeah. Basically, this goes exactly how you think it's going to go from the second they leave the prison. Like, yeah. it's not going to end any other way besides the way that it ends. But to what we kind of reiterate, we talked about before, like, everyone's actions are, like, the most generous read of what, you know, it could possibly be. And that's a very Spielbergian thing where, like, mm -hmm. the, you know, the main couple are as, as sympathetic as they can be. And even, you know, Captain Tanner is as sympathetic as he can be, despite the fact that, like, his job is to basically shoot this guy and he knows it from the from the word jump and we know from the word jump he yeah he tries for the whole movie to just convince them to stop you know give up if you stop now you'll get a you know your sentence won't be too bad you know this is not going to end well if you keep going he tries to convince them and then but they never do real quick i just wanted to like just touch on some of my favorite moments uh mm -hmm. in this movie yeah good i idea. love the uh the scene when they bring out the porta potty and mm -hmm. out, out yeah, the field that's good. Uh, you see there there the hundreds of, the hundreds of cop cars you know lined up on the street everybody watching them and then uh the uh Will Atherton's character uh uh Clovis uh makes a has a wise moment where he's like boy I sure wouldn't want to unload this buckshot into the porta potty <laughs> and then, and no one comes out, and then he says it one more time, and, and oh, yep, there was a police officer hiding in the can. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so I love that, and then comes out with, and his, then, with his gun out and his hands up. I also loved, and this is very, very Texan, uh, the scene where the uh, amateur police <laughs> shoot up the the yes. the, the car lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, funny, but also maybe a little too true to be funny right, exactly See, yeah. it's yeah. it's funny for 1974 let's say let's put it that way yeah what were some of y'all's favorites real quick yeah hugo favorite scene uh i don't know um my favorite scenes in this movie were the quieter ones where you mm. could see the police officer um, sort of bonding with them even though he he had been kidnapped and understanding yeah, that good. they're not bad people and you know the, the, some of the scenes where they where she gives him a jacket because he was cold or they sort of when they go through the crowd and and this be, because this becomes a big national event 
and then people come out to see these guys who are who are basically managing to kidnap a cop without being shot and and they're curious about them so crowds sort of flood the streets and 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 go meet right. this car I, I think those scenes the, mo- the more endearing scenes are the ones that i gravitated to more towards i i liked that scene a lot too where they like drive through the crowd and the crowd's like a big fan of theirs and like give like shower them with gifts and everything uh that was very Bonnie and Clyde as well, because like yeah. in, in Bonnie and Clyde, they're they're like national heroes. So like that was that was where like it drew the the closest line to Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, mm-hmm. My actual favorite scene, other than that, or you know, I like that scene, but my favorite scene is when they're watching the Wiley e. Coyote Roadrunner cartoon uh, oh, by the yes. drive-in, and Clovis does the sound effects for Lou Jean, and she starts laughing, but then he kind of like sees what's happening to coyote and like sees himself in that and has like a bit of an existential moment where he realizes this isn't going to go well for him just like it never goes well for wiley coyote um so the scene where they drive through the crowd of people is like the the closest connection to me for close connection for me for to bonnie and clyde the part where they watch road run around coyote is the closest to um raising arizona because uh the cone brothers actually like designed h.i mcdonough Nicholas Cage's character in Raising Arizona, they designed him off Wile E. Coyote, which if you watch that movie with that in mind, it's, it makes it even funnier. So like yeah. those were like the two the two moments where like Sugarland Express is closest to the two poles that I was talking about earlier, Bonnie and Clyde in, in Raising Arizona. I love that scene where they watch the watch Wile E. Coyote. Yeah. Okay, well let's let's get into our our main topic now. Um, Wait, you... hang on, hang on. Like, what, what, oh, we have to. Oh, that's right. Week? We do have to. Let's wrap up this. What, topic. Uh, what we do with all the <laughs> films to remember, which is our version of the film club. Uh, is we rank them we rank every film to remember that we're ever going to see on one single list and it's going to eventually get messy but for now it's pretty easy because our current ranking is the thing at number one and jackie brown at number two does anybody and sugarland express at number three yeah, yeah. Does sugarland anyone express want, at number argue... three okay yes ne- never mind <laughs> i was gonna talk about it but yeah yeah i mean it's it's, i really enjoyed sugarland yeah. express much more than i was actually anticipating i would but yeah me too uh it, it's still not jackie brown it's not on the level of the other ones no. the thing <laughs> you can tell you can tell it's you know it's a theatrical debut and it's a very good one but it's still you know the, the first movie in a career that is going to get a lot better from there so anyway yes. let's jump into our main topic which is steven spielberg what do we think about him uh, why was he able to be so relevant and so good for so long and what is it that really makes him so great um I'd like to start, uh, first of all, with, with some a few basic facts about uh, Spielberg's career, uh, namely for, uh, starting with the fact that he's directed over 30, he's directed over 30 movies. He made 33, if you don't count uh, the, the upcoming remake of uh, New York, no, not New York, New York, what is it called? West Side, West Side, West Side Story. Story that he's making. And yes. he was a producer on over 130, which was a stat that surprise me because that's a lot over an almost 50 year career um he's the highest grossing director of all time with 10.5 billion dollars made from his movies worldwide which is more than four bit almost four billion more than the pe- than the people who are second on that list who are the russo brothers currently um his films have garnered a total of 134 academy award nominations uh, with 34 wins and two for best director, which he won for Schindler's List. Is that just what? Sorry, is that just his directed movies? Just his directed movies. Wow. Just his directed wow. movie has have 134 nomination and 34 wins, which is insane. And he won twice. It's for, pretty good. He, yeah, he's pretty good. He won twice for best director for Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan, which should have also won best picture instead of whatever Shakespeare in Love. But let's not get let's not go there. And finally, uh, we were talking before about John Williams. He collaborated with John Williams for twenty eight of his thirty three films. So the two of them are basically, you know, it, the the longest running collaboration in cinema right now. Yeah, I suppose unless you count Robert De Niro and Scorsese, maybe I don't know. Well, th- I think this predates there. Yeah, it does. it's yeah. probably before because it was seventy four. Yeah, yeah, probably. But anyway, uh, well, of course, it was was did you on the Mean Streets? That's on the new topic, I think so. different topic. I think so. <laughs> Sorry. I think so. But anyway, um, how do you guys feel about Spielberg in general? I want to know um, what was what was the first movie you saw by him? 
and what, what what's your history with his movies? Josh, why don't you start us off? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, the first movie I saw of his was the shirt I'm wearing, which is Jurassic Park. Um, hmm. I saw that when I was like I don't know, like four or five when I was way too young. But um, wow. I've been obsessed with that movie for you know 25 years now since I first saw it. Um, I didn't actually. I feel like I didn't actually like get to his older things until like adulthood. Like I didn't really see like Jaws or ET or even like Raiders until probably my twenties, which is not when you're supposed to see those movies for the first time. Um, so I think that my relationship to Spielberg is maybe a little different than everyone else's. Cause I feel like most people hold on to those three movies as, you know, gospel and you know, they are gospel, but like I didn't get to them till later in life. So like I had seen, um, kind of a random assortment of Spielberg movies before I ever saw those. Uh, I, I, like I think about the movies that like were released in theaters when I was a teenager, uh, hmm. just because that's kind of like when you start going to the movies a lot for the first time when I was like 12, 13. So like catch me if you can is an important Spielberg movie to me. Minority report is a very important Spielberg movie to me just because I was the, I was the right age when they, when they came to me. And um, I think there's something to that. Uh, he's um, his, his movies are, you know, they, a lot of them have an action adventure bent, which is kind of like tailor made for someone in adolescence, you know, like um, he, he does make a lot of movies uh, about kids. So kids like his movies and he makes a lot of just exciting action adventure stuff. So it's kind of perfect right in the pocket for a 12 year old. So like, I think that like the Spielberg movies you get to when you're like 12, 13 are going to be the ones that you hold on to for the rest of your life. At least that's been my experience. What about you, Chris? Well, uh, the first one that I remember seeing would have been Hook. Uh, right. <laughs> Makes sense. Because I was the right age for it <laughs> at the time. And uh, uh, I honestly, like, you know, Hook's, Hook's fine. And, and even as a kid, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't love Hook. And I wonder if that's, you know, why it took me a little longer to really, like, respect Steven Spielberg's movies as, like, you know, like, oh, my gosh, this is a Spielberg movie. I should go see that. Uh, because I didn't see Jurassic Park as a, as a really young child, because uh, my parents thought it would be too scary for me. And uh, I, I did see it as a child, but I was probably a little bit older than, you know, a lot of people. Look, certainly older than Josh would have been at the time that he saw it. <laughs> my, parents, my parents sat me down before watching it and, like, explained it wasn't real and, like, also explained to me, if you don't move, a T-Rex can't see you. So, like, <laughs> telling me that piece of information made Jurassic Park less scary watching it, so... They gave me the the prep talk. Yeah. So I, you know, and I also, I had also seen ET when I was very young and, um, I, I definitely, you know, I, I wish I had started rating movies when I was younger. Cause when I went back a few years ago and started thinking about like some of these movies that I watched as a kid, I remembered not liking ET that much, but I, I, after rewatching it as an adult, I enjoyed it more. Um, so I, I, I he definitely makes movies that are, four children uh in a lot of them are uh and then uh but they're also enough for adults that um you you can still appreciate them more as you grow up and of course the other the other ones that i remember watching as a kid were in the indiana jones movies which uh you know i i i may have actually seen that before i saw hook but you know i don't remember it's like like with Star Wars. Right. I don't remember a time where I hadn't watched Star Wars. I don't remember a time where I hadn't watched Indiana Jones. So, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> what about you, Hugo? Yeah, so for That's me, how it be. for me, uh, the first uh, I was born in 1996. So, you know, all these movies, a lot of them came out before I was born, and so I, I started seeing these on Italian television with Italian dubs, which, in retrospect, are absolutely awful and you should never do dubbing <laughs> on these types of because they, they just sound terrible but the first ones i saw were the indiana jones movies because they because italian television would just run those all the time and et and then uh it, it wasn't it wasn't until much later that i started becoming aware of spielberg as a director because there was sort of sort of a group of movies that i saw as a child that i i didn't think about them in terms of who directed them like back to the future uh the goonies all these types of movies that i, I just thought oh it's probably the same director because <laughs> they they have the same feel sort of to them um it, it was only later i think the first 
theatrically released movie I saw from Spielberg was Kid- Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which I saw with my dad uh, in the cinema. Um, and then after that, I started getting interested in his movies and watching the, his more serious stuff uh and you know the the more hard hard hitting dramas and stuff and you know Mm -hmm. and it was only recently that i saw jurassic park for the first time it was a few years ago um which i loved it i i I just hadn't seen it before and then from then on i just became a massive fan and i've seen most of his movies and i just love most of them um it's i think i want to point on something that we've we've kind of all said is that you know grizz you don't remember a time when you weren't aware of Raiders of the Lost Ark right. and mm-hmm. it sounds like Hugo you kind of were they've been yeah, with, no, I, those movies have been with you for a long time as well I, I can and remember like, being really scared by Temple of Doom but I don't remember that people sense, having yeah. seen it Kali yeah I mean honestly like <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I I didn't like sit down and watch Raiders until my 20s but like I think had seen I'd seen bits of pieces of that and Temple of Doom as a kid because like I don't think I've ever actually actually sat down and watched Temple of Doom, but like I remember seeing that scene, the heart ripping mm-hmm. scene as a kid. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, and, like, and you had mentioned that you like hadn't the, seen the other Indiana Jones movies, and we need to talk about that. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, this has been this has been a problem for years for me. I just need to sit down and watch them. But like Jurassic Park for me has been been with me since I was a kid, and like it's just so ingrained in my bones. And like that's kind of what I think Spielberg can his movies have done for an entire culture for 40 years is they're just like ingrained in our bones whichever whichever movie it is for you someone has at least a couple of Spielberg movies that they just have always been with yeah he's so ubiquitous that yeah like a lot of movies i think that if you're not paying attention when you're you know first hearing about them it might not even fully register that that's another spielberg movie whether it be one mm-hmm. of the ones that he produced or directed because he's so prolific he's his hands are on everything <laughs> maybe the most important person in hollywood for the last 50 yeah, years yeah I, I i definitely in the in the could be. in the picture on yeah. that yeah could be considering also all the stuff that he's produced uh, the collaborations he's had you know he's worked with with zemeckis he's worked with lucas he launched well he didn't launch but you know kathleen kennedy the, the, he she's the most successful female producer ever and she started with you know, producing Spielberg movies. Mm-hmm. It, there's it, he's sort of the history of Hollywood starting from the seventies to almost today. I, I would argue he's not as absolutely you know not as relevant as he used to be. Still, you know, it's really impressive. Um, what I wanted to to propose to you guys is uh, I think his movies can be divided into two, broadly speaking, can be divided into two groups. Uh, on the one side is the sci-fi fantasy adventure, which are usually, not always, but usually uh, child-friendly. And then he has the historical dramas that are usually about war. Some of them are really harrowing and, and you know, uh, horrible to, to, to think about and watch uh, in a way. But uh, so he has these two very different uh, groups of movie types of movies that he makes. But what do you think? are the main themes that bring them all together what do you think is his trademark that you can find in all of his movies even if they're so varied and so different from each other well i see in the outline we have childlike wonder which is yeah. good because that's probably the number one thing uh <laughs> i um i uh I, I read an article a few weeks ago um about how spielberg his early movies are all from the perspective of kids Mm-hmm. And then um, later, in, like at the midpoint of his career, they kind of shift perspective and they become about parenthood. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is uh, Bill Jabiri is the writer who wrote that. And he said that like right in the middle of Hook is right when you can see the transition completely happen because that movie begins about a guy trying to reconnect with his childhood and ends with a being about a guy trying you know, to acknowledge the fact he's a father. Yeah. And like if you look at like E.T. and Close Encounters and all that, you know, pre-1991 movies they are like childlike wonder and then beyond that like you look at Jurassic Park and Minority Report like they're about parenthood you know and I Saving Private really, Ryan where there's like even, you know, even faux movies, fathers yeah I was gonna say Sorry, even go like ahead. Close Encounters is not I mean uh, the focus of the movie isn't on children but it, there's still a childlike wonder mm-hmm. the, the awe, awe yeah. uh, throughout that whole movie and the suspense of like I, we we've talked about this on some of the previous stuff that I don't I don't get into weirdness for weirdness sake, but 
I think that like within Close Encounters, things are weird, uh, but it's engaging with you, and it's not just to make you go, oh, that's weird. It's to draw you in further, and I think that's another thing that he does uh, in a lot of his movies is pepper in things that draw you just a little bit further and a little bit further into whatever through line for the story he has. So like in Close Encounters, it was, you know, what what is what is happening here? What is what is actually you know, I don't want to spoil it, but you know, you know, what what's where is this going? And I think you see that again in movies like AI, uh, where you get just every little bit brings you just another step closer. Um, and I, you know, so I think that's another through line that I, I I see through, especially through his his sci-fi fantasy adventure. The historical dramas are, like you said, a kind of a different animal altogether. Uh, and I think th- they are, but I will say it. it w- the, the point that Josh brings up is something that I that I completely agree with. You can see a through line of fatherhood throughout all of his movies. From a changing point of view, uh, I feel like the, the, the middle is not just Hook, but even uh, in Jan- the third in John Jones movie is about reconciling mm-hmm. with absent fathers. Because even in his life, the, the sort of late 80s, beginning of the 90s was the period of his life where he, where he was sort of reconciling with the fact that his father had been absent during his childhood but he sort of managed to re-engage a relationship with him and as you go on even the historical dramas um you know schindler's list uh, schindler is in a way a father figure um, yes. munich munich the protagonist definitely is about being a, a father new, definitely about <laughs> a new father and, and like even it. finally yes i was going to get there in the late stage of his career it's about fatherhood seen from a positive light which you wouldn't have have expected if you'd seen the early movies because a lot of the early movies about mm-hmm. fathers are not being there pursuing something that it, it uh, is war of the worlds yeah war of the worlds yeah it, it's they're all Bad they father. gradually get more and more positive towards fathers and finally you get to lincoln which is you know a movie about the father of the nation in spielberg in spielberg's eyes so it, it it's definitely I, an interesting I, I... through line I think for the his, his historical dramas, the through line that I would connect is that he's always trying to emphasize the humanity in these historical situations, whether yes. it be, you know, a story about the Holocaust is emphasizing the humanity, a story about soldiers in World War II, he's emphasizing their humanity and like the value of a human life is kind of the point of Saving Private Ryan. Um, Lincoln, he's yeah. humanizing just this larger than life godlike figure in American history. And in Munich, he's taking like a spy assassin story and again finding the humanity in there and that's kind of i think what he's doing with all those is like taking these larger than life events and just humanizing them as best he can which is what makes them so relatable and i think is what makes even his worst movie is still engaging for the most part Uh, maybe not his worst movie his worst movie is is not good but (laughs) it'll look even his worst movies will get you to feel something for his character have you all seen 1941 I've not. I've not. Okay. That's his worst movie. Okay. <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll I'll be sure to watch it. But you know, in general, his worst movies. Let's put it plural. I think most of them you can you can have an emotional reaction to them. If I could you, touch you, on one more thing, with uninterested, with, go ahead. With 1941, it upset me because <laughs> I watched that re- recently. Uh, it, it, upset me. <laughs> it upset me that they wasted John Williams' incredible score for that movie. For that movie. On such a stupid movie. <laughs> <laughs> I have to see it now. Now I have to see. It. I'm gonna watch it tonight. It's a, I mean, it's it's a comedy. It's a comedy about you know about World War Two, and uh, that's a tough tough thing to do. And there's he yeah. succeeds in some regards on that, but it is nonsensical and and just not not well executed at all. And I it's honestly when I watched it. I was shocked that it was the same director that did all these other movies. Like basically every other movie he makes is at least a seven for me. <laughs> yeah. And then this is just yeah, bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can Can you give me a Can you give me ten seconds on the terminal? Okay. Well, so it's, I haven't watched the terminal recently. I enjoyed the terminal when I saw it. <laughs> me too. Me too. I I think the terminal that's, is that fun. was like yeah. It's it's fun. Yeah. It's you know it's unusual. I think in comparison to a lot of his other movies because it's not sci-fi or it's not uh, adventure and it's not like historical drama it's just a character piece about this this fish out of water 
and mm-hmm. uh, I love Tom Hanks, so that might have given term- the Terminal a, a little boost for me. Uh, Tom well, Hanks that movie... is impossible not to love. Like anything he's <laughs> yes. doing in a film, you just oh, that's Tom Hanks. Oh, he's so nice. <laughs> I mean, that movie gets kind of shit on a lot, but uh, it introduced me to Stanley Tucci, so it can't be that uh, bad. I mean, I, brilliant then. It's, no, I think it's, it's a fun good. movie. I think it's it, a pretty again, good story. Like, I'm not surprised yeah. that The Terminal isn't registered in the pantheon of Spielberg's greatest movies as, you know, <laughs> anything particularly special, but it's fun. Like, you know, don't, don't, don't crap on The Terminal. There's no reason to. Crap on 1941. I'm not, I like it's Terminal. Bad. I'm not talking to you, John. I'm talking <laughs> to the general populace. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about Spielberg and like his uh, techniques, like the 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 things you how he uses cinema as it says yes. in the outline. So I I put this on the outline because I think a Spielberg movie for the most part is very recognizable, um, regardless of dialogue, story, subject matter, uh, because of the way he he shoots f- things. He 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 cuts very little compared to other directors, especially action directors. Yes. And even on very simple scenes, so scenes of dialogue, scenes that are set in a room, he often only has a few shots and uses blocking. He moves moves his characters around all the time in a way that that's, seems so natural when you watch it that you don't even notice that he's doing a long shot. Yes. But yes. it's actually really technical, really precise, and it looks... So it makes them look so realistic, makes you feel like you're there in a way that a lot of cuts sometimes, you know, sort of uh, draw you out a little bit. Uh, but that's definitely a hallmark of his films. Have you have you guys seen the video essay on YouTube called "The Spielberg Winner" from I have, Freeman Yes, Painting? I have not. Okay, so that's oh, it's that's brilliant. Exactly what you're talking about, Hugo. Yeah, it's it's very good. Grizz, I recommend it. All the listeners, I recommend it. Uh, again, YouTube, "The Spielberg Winner," Edward Freeman Painting, um, and he talks about how like. There are what he calls invisible long shots in mm-hmm. Spielberg movies because they'll be like seventy to ninety seconds long, which isn't very like ostentatious in term in the, you know as far as long shots go. But like it, it really is just like setting a camera in the room, setting the characters in a very specific place, and then moving the camera and the characters around and like not cutting, like you said. And it kind of gives you like it gives the effect of cutting because it has like different setups and different blocking and different angles. But there aren't cuts, just the camera and characters moving within the frame. And it's, again, very subtle, but also very, very effective, as, as Hugo said. Another uh, thing that I think I've seen in quite a few of his movies, at least by my memory, uh, is uh, a he does he does these shots where the characters are almost just silhouettes uh, based on mm-hmm. because of the lighting. Yes. Oh, and yeah, in definitely. particular, I remember that in The Color Purple and in Sugarland Express, we saw that in the the, the but also in Raiders final scene yeah in Raiders there's that, too there's that shot where he's standing with the staff and there's the sun behind and you can only see him and the hat yeah and I that's a recurring thing I think sure. that's an, a, one of his that's recurring encounters. things and when I see that I'm like yeah this is a Spielberg moment <laughs> mm-hmm. and you have John Williams music swelling well of course <laughs> yeah not in color yeah. purple though well I guess <laughs> well uh, as long as we're talking about like visuals like in his later career in the last like 20 30 years he's he's worked almost exclusively with Janusz Kaminski the cinematographer um and I don't know if you guys are familiar with Janusz Kaminski's work but the uh the white lighting is a is a, just a very very Kaminski thing so if you ever see two characters talking dialogue and the light from the window is like just pure white mm-hmm. no yellow at all that's Kaminski and that is a uh, do you know why he does that movies have looked I don't I don't know. I guess it's just like his style. It looks nice. And And I mean, Kaminsky's worked with it. It doesn't take me out of anything. Like it seems like you would think that just pure white light would be a little, uh, you know, distracting. But it doesn't take me out of it. But no. Yeah, I mean, like it's you you can kind of like. Now that I say that, you might be able to like notice that more. But like every Spielberg movie for the last like twenty years has been shot and lit by this guy, and like that's Mm -hmm. just like kind of. When I think of Janusz Kaminsky, I just think of like white lighting, Hmm. and And that's kind of how Spielberg movies have looked for twenty years now. And I think it, it's really noticeable, especially in his two, in his early two thousands movies, because yeah, this, this thing of white lighting was sort of a trend even at that time, even in other films. And, and Minority you, Report looks really washed it. out. It does. Minority Report, War of the yeah. Worlds, AI. You can definitely yes. see this. Yes. Yes. Characters yes. almost yes. have yes. a weird white glow about them, but it mm-hmm. sort of works definitely. well. It gives it, it creates an atmosphere and it gives them a sheen because 
these are in the are these three are sci-fi movies so you can put them in the sci-fi adventure group but they're, they're a lot darker compared to his earlier work in that genre and so this washed out color sort of puts you in the mood and and and, and creates an atmosphere that fits you know but anyway in terms of um direction uh, artistic style i think two interesting things to talk about are the way he shoots action uh which i think is something really underrated about him because um what he does with action scenes is relatively simple he just points the camera at the action and lets it play out which seems you know really easy to do but a lot of directors don't know how to stage action in a way that they can do that they can't show the action that well they have to cut all they the have time to cut all they the have time, to get yeah. a, they have to get a lot of coverage because they don't they they don't they don't really manage to plan these elaborate set pieces that spielberg does that the chase that leads into another chase that leads into a fist fight and he also manages to always get the actors that want to do these scenes because at the beginning of his career he was working with with uh Harrison Ford, obviously, uh, for a lot of his action movies, obviously with, with Indiana Jones. And then he got to work with uh, Tom Cruise, who's the crazy stuntman actor of the decade now. And so he... he we'll, he, we'll see him die on screen eventually. We will, and he <laughs> he will love it from his yes. weird Scientology planet that he'll get when he dies. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, Hugo, what you're getting into is that Spielberg... Uh, knows the best way to stage whatever he's shooting yes i think and he he, and whether he's you know talking about blocking a subtle runner for a dialogue scene or you know planning out a car chase like he is very efficient in his imagery Mm -hmm. and his cutting and um he always shows you you know just what he needs to show you he's he's a, a absolute master of cinematic language and i don't know if that's because he's influenced cinematic language so much in the last 40 years that like everything we see now is from him or if he just kind of just came on the scene fully formed and just used all the techniques that work so well but um i also want to point out that i've you know listened to interviews with with a lot i listen to a lot of like working filmmaker interviews and by all accounts like secondhand accounts spielberg's a very very hardworking man right like it's not just he didn't just it's not just easy for him to make these movies that are you know cultural touchdowns for 40 years like he's a hard-working guy and a, and a planner and like plans this stuff out and it, it, it shows on screen i think that's what makes him capable of tackling so many different genres so well is that it's not about necessarily him being a master of sci-fi or a master of history it's he's a master filmmaker and mm-hmm. so he can like you're talking about with setting up the blocking or how to shoot how to shoot an action scene how, how to visualize that before he's actually in the moment shooting it and that is something that is obviously very hard to come by and uh he, you know count his blessings that he has that natural gift <laughs> and he's a right. pure director too like he doesn't write a lot of his movies. like most of his movies he hasn't written he has a few writing credits but a lot of his movies are written by other people he he just sort of uh tells the story with direction uh, most of all well, let- let's make that distinction he doesn't have many writing credits yes that's different from you know he, i'm assuming he has a hand in crafting all of these scripts has, to some extent most directors do i think he has a, a huge hand in crafting some of the common story elements that you find in his movies but the actual script isn't written by him but like i don't mm-hmm. think he writes dialogue i doubt that he writes dialogue i think he gets the best people to write dialogue that he wants for the story that he wants to tell. Like, for example, one of these movies is written by the Coen brothers, Bridge of Spies. It's written by the Coen brothers. It's really good, by the way. Yeah. Uh, So we keep going, coming back to them. We'll have to do an episode on them eventually. Um, Right. And then I can explain my stance on No Country for All. (laughs) (laughs) God, man. Like, that's when Josh is going to have a walk off. (laughs) I probably will, to be honest. (laughs) <laughs> but he, he is he is definitely a director's director. He that's he, yes. that's him. His passion, his and his talent is purely into the directing, and so he's sort of right. perfected it. Yeah, and he's taken the style of old Hollywood in a way because he, he he uses a lot of classical uh, techniques, uh, but he manages mm-hmm. to 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 make them work today, which which is right. impressive. So um, and I, I think we need we should probably sorry, move sorry, into your, you your final question and then and then move into our, our last segment. 
yeah yeah uh final point well i think we kind of just we, we kind of just talked about like why we think he's been able to be this good and relevant for so long we just kind of discussed that he's you know a, a quintessential director like when people think of a movie director they think of steven spielberg mm-hmm. and like when i yeah. think of how movies are supposed to look i think of steven spielberg movies he's just you know so ubiquitous at this point like Chris said i just want to point out about why he's been relevant is i think he also has um really good instincts uh both from storytelling pr- perspective but also from like a movie business perspective um he was maybe the key figure in getting the PG-13 rating to into existence in the 80s. Uh, mm-hmm. He kind of, not just him, but he was one of the main players who saw, who had the vision to see that, like, teenagers were a major, major market for movie going, and they kind of didn't have a an area for them to direct movies towards teenagers because they had PG and they had R and then what's in between. And, like, Spielberg movies kind of were in between there and so he um i guess was one of the major figures who um worked for the mpa mpaa to get a pg-13 rating and he uh exploited that you know from a business perspective because that is like a major market for movie going as teenagers um and as far as the, we had you had one other question on the outline here uh do we think that he's in the twilight of his career or not as good as he once was uh and from my perspective uh it's tough to say he the movies he's done recently are, you know, some of them have been what you expect from Spielberg and then others have been, you know, not up to our lofty expectations for him. So it's not necessarily that I think he's in the twilight of his career. I think he's still, you know, trying and making, you know, good movies. They're just, maybe we've, maybe we've lifted our expectations too high for Spielberg at this point. At least that's my perspective. Okay, the reason I put that question in is I personally still think he's really good. I Even movies that he's made recently, The Post is a movie I love. Uh, Bridge of Spies is a movie I love. It was a Best Picture nominee. <laughs> yeah, but Both I mean... Those were. I, yes, yeah, those but were. A, lot of, a lot of Spielberg movies get Best Picture nominees, nominations, but they're not as highly regarded as some of his work from you know, the 80s and 90s and 70s. You know? Yes. So... In that sense, is is what I'm I'm getting at. I I'm just wondering, is he still the best around? Is he still capable of making an absolute masterpiece that is going to stand up in twenty years? Because I think it's been a good fifteen years since uh, since he's been that person. Um, you know what I mean? He's made in the in the 2010s. He's made a lot of very good dramas, but. None of them, I would say, are masterpieces that you're going to be rewatching in 20 years. I agree. I mean, I I, I loved Bridge of Spies. I haven't watched it since 2015 when it came out. Same. Yeah. However, I, I think if I don't know, I think if anybody else made Bridge of Spies and it turned out as good as it did, like we would kind of be making a bigger deal out of it. But like, kind of, you said, that Hugo, could, it's kind of just the bar so high at this point. You know, it's just like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, Spielberg made another really, really great movie. Okay. You know, yeah. and whether he's in the twilight of his career, I mean, you know, when you start your career with Jaws and E.T. and Raiders of the Lost the Ark in the first encounters. seven years <laughs> of you making movies, yeah, like, it, you know, those movies made, like, adjusted for inflation, like a billion dollars, you know, I'm exaggerating, but not by much, <laughs> and, you know, have been in the cultural consciousness for, you know, 40 plus years, so, like, you're, it's hard to top that, you know, it is after really you've been hard. doing it for so long. It is really um, hard. Yeah. But I wonder. I wonder if he's gonna do. I wonder if he's ever gonna do another great action adventure movie. Because the last few, I don't think have been probably. As good. Yeah, probably. I think he will my, on that so. front. I, I think so. the area yeah. that we're gonna see that he is not able to do as well as he once was are the kid-oriented movies, like yes. Adventures of Tintin and BFG. I haven't seen the BFG, but by all accounts, I have. It was, but it's not great. No. It, was, it was okay. I actually really enjoyed yeah. uh, Tintin, more, certainly more than I was expecting to. But it's also Tintin's pretty good. Uh, the it's whole fine, time I was watching you know? the Adventures of Tintin, I was thinking, "Boy, this would be a lot better if he had just made it a, a, a you know a live action movie." <laughs> yeah. If it or yeah. if it just was Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and even Ready Player One, I'm not sure if you guys have seen it. I have. You know, it, it's another. And film. I enjoyed Ready I Player One fine. as well, but it, it, it's enjoyable. It's entertaining, but. There's not, you know, I thought I think there's not enough there compared to his older stuff in that genre. 
true. But still, you know, I, I still think he's one of my favorite directors. I think he's still one of the best around. Any film that he makes, I'm going to go see it, regardless of what it is. Uh, this remake that he's doing, I would not care about it at all if it was any other filmmaker but because it's him oh, I'll, you know I'll pretty yeah. much watch it I'm as soon as it comes out also west side story is written by tony kushner who also wrote lincoln and wrote munich so like i feel like the kushner spielberg combination is is working produced a pretty good movie so so far so i'm yeah i'm, I'm all in on west side story yeah i'm excited right. for it now especially after rewatching all these things it it'll be cool uh i mean to see it, something new from it to see yeah i mean he hasn't it, it's he hadn't done a musical, right? Like, am I forgetting no. anything? No. So I don't think so. <laughs> this will be fun. Number in Temple of Doom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, well, let's move into uh, the last segment. For our final segment, for our final segment, I'm gonna. Re- I'm the only one who knows this. I'm going to. Re- you guys basically sent me uh, your top ten lists of Spielberg movies privately, and I added up the points the way we did the Tarantino last week. Uh, and I'm going to reveal the top official top five of the film to remember. The Spielberg movies, and remember you guys are going to react. <laughs> yeah, remember the film. Sorry, <laughs> our branding is what are, what are we too close again? to each other. Uh, what's your name? What's your name? <laughs> John. 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 Sorry, what? John. Okay, John and Grows. What's number five? John and Grows and Horatio. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, at number five we have Jaws. At Interesting. Number four, we have, I think, what is what will be surprising for most of the audience is Minority Report. Um, Sweet. That made number four? Yes. We all, yes. all three of us love all that right. movie. Uh, number okay. three, we have Jurassic Park. Ooh. At number two, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And at number one, Schindler's List. So, okay. How do we feel about that list? I know I was surprised to not have personally the the most surprising one for me was et i can't believe et is not in our top five that's probably that's on me <laughs> yeah it's on oh, me okay. as well no, i mean you, like we both I mean, we, we, both, we both said that like that's that's a movie that you should see at a young age and it sounds like me and grizz neither of us did yeah and so it's it's hard for et to unseat jurassic park on my list or right. even my Minority report which is kind of interesting but it's what it is my Minority report is the most underrated spielberg movie for me I, I love it. I think it's I, fantastic. I am obsessed with that movie. Again, like that came out, like it released in theaters when I was 12, which is like mm-hmm. the right age to see yeah. that. And uh, I, I still remember the Roger Ebert quote that they put in the TV spot and on the DVD box, which is, uh, it reminds us why we go to the movies in the first place. And like, yeah. hell yeah, dude. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel about That's that a good movie. Quote. It's so good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm a little surprised uh, I that Jaws is at five. I know that Jaws is you know is not in my top five, uh, no. but I expected it to be near oh, the yeah. top for both of you. I have it at three, well, and Josh has it at four. And so, yeah, so you know, because I, I you asked, have it I asked you both. Yeah, I asked you both about when we were making these lists, are these best or favorite? Mm-hmm. And you both kind of said it was a little bit of both. So I tried to make yeah. mine a little bit of both. And so my ranking was a little bit of one for me, one for them kind of thing. Right. So like, you know, <laughs> my uh, I, I put Jaws, Jaws snuck it in my top five. But like, realistically, I've seen Catch Me If You Can far more times than I've seen See, Jaws. I've seen The Lost World Jurassic Park more than I've seen Jaws, you know. <laughs> Hugo must just, have, Hugo, have you seen Catch Me If You Can? Of course I have. It's at my number 11. Okay. So it's I was just good. significantly lower for you because Catch Me If You Can is my number two. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but here's the thing. For yes. me, the top, uh, I have, I'm going to bring out my whole list, but I think the top 13 or 14 are all just fantastic films. Well, and yeah. <laughs> it, it becomes, I think my top seven or eight is pretty set. I have Jurassic Park at six. I have Saving Private Ryan at seven and then Last Crusade. But after that, it, it becomes really difficult to, to choose which one is, you know, higher or lower. Yeah, again, in in the in the respect of best or favorite, like I, I love Catch Me If You Can. It's maybe maybe other than Jurassic Park, my most seen Spielberg movie. But like I can't put that behind Saving put that ahead of Saving Private Ryan or Schindler's List, you yeah. know, in good conscience. You know, even that's where it gets well, kind of fuzzy. Well, Chris favorite did. He versus, didn't care. Versus best. I did not mind. And in I mean, fact, and, and I, I respect have that Saving because... Private Ryan as my number ten. Do you want to know? I mean, do you want good to know for the you, rest man. of the top yeah. ten? Yeah, go ahead. What's the rest of the top ten? Yeah, go for it. 
Okay, uh, on our shared list, I mean. So these are the honorable mentions. <laughs> honorable mentions, yeah. And number okay. six, we have Catch Me If You Can, which is really close. It, Fantastic. But it was four points behind Jaws, so quite a lot. Then we have... Uh, people, please watch that. Like, I feel like no one talks about Catch Me If You Can anymore 18 years later. And it's so it's, good. It's, it is. Really honestly, good. I think it's the most fun Spielberg movie. It's one of them. It was okay. my favorite DiCaprio performance I mean, until Once Upon a Time in Hollywood last no, year. No, I mean, like, it's just saying something. It's fun. You know? It's a good time. Like, you, you know, the character gets in, is getting into trouble and, and he's stuff. getting away with it. And it, it's just fun. It's, it is. It is really fun. It is really fun. And and I love the ending of that movie so much. I think the fact that they mm-hmm. sort of become, uh, it's kind of spoilers, but, you know, they, they sort of bond in a way yeah they become friends and that, that that's that's fun it's interesting. maybe the real check fraud was the friends we made along the way <laughs> <laughs> yes okay yeah so what else then we, got? we have we have uh at seven we have saving private ryan and on eight we have et okay. come on guys okay eight seriously yeah. i can't believe I'm, et it's got eight on my eight list it's 21 on my list <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez wow Twit, wow then we have Close Encounters at nine, and at ten we have Last Crusade. I was surprised Close, okay. Close Encounters is that low. It's not on my list at all because I haven't seen ah, it. Ah, well that'll I do have. it. It's <laughs> yeah, my that's number why. nine. Yeah. It's my number nine. Um, I like it a lot, but and just not as much. Have you all seen one. Color Purple? Because that's another one that I wanted to give yes, a, a no, an honorable my, mention to. It's it's my number ten. I think the Color Purple is fantastic. My only reservation with color purple and the reason it's not higher on my list than it might be just based on the movie is uh spielberg was adamant that he should be the only person like not he but a jewish director should be the only person to make schindler's list and then with color purple i feel like it, it it's the kind of thing that could have been better if it was a black director although i still love it Let's i think just... it's fantastic i think whoopi, whoopi and, goldberg uh, is amazing Spike Lee would it. definitely agree with you <laughs> yeah, Spike Lee would probably agree with but me. But also, let's and he wouldn't you be know, wrong. To, to be to be fair, Color Purple came out I think eight years before Schindler's yes. List, so it's quite possible that Spielberg Changed may have mind. felt that yes. a Jewish and well, he he may have felt the Jewish person should make Schindler's List because of his experience on Color Purple. For all we know, I don't I don't be, really know. Could that. be it's yeah. it's definitely you can tell that Color Purple is um, him at a point of his career where he was at the height of his powers, but he was sort of being pigeonholed as the fun action adventure director. Mm-hmm. And so he wanted yeah, yeah. to do something harder and more complex and more hard hitting. And so he did that, at which which worked out because I, I still, again, it's a fantastic film. I just have that little tiny bit of reservation with it. Whereas Schindler's List is number one on my list because for so many reasons. It's uh, number one on my I, list as well. It's. I, I think it's his masterpiece in more than one way. I think that the way he adapts his even his visual style to tell that story, the fact that because all of his all of his movies have sort of a Hollywood sheen to them, they look perfect. Schindler's List is raw. It's shot with a lot of uh, handheld camera. It's the, the black and white adds a bleakness to it. it the way he he took this story and adapted even the way he makes movies to tell this story is is so impressive to me and also my family name is in the first scene of St. Schindler's List where they show all the the uh what are they called all the the, the, the trunks and all the the, the baggage mm. of the people who are being deported being thrown away and, and you can see surnames on them and, and there's Neumann which is the surname of my mother so I have sort of a mm. that extra connection there yeah yeah right so. yeah my uh my wife does uh she's in the fundraising world and mm-hmm. she does work with the los angeles museum of the holocaust right. and so um uh it, it's hard to overstate like how important of a movie schindler's list is like it's kind of stating the obvious but like holocaust awareness is kind of going down more than yeah, more than uh, you think seems sane yeah and uh it's kind of getting scary how the knowledge of the Holocaust is how low that that's getting. So um, I think Schindler's List is maybe the most important movie of, of the nineties or, if, you know, all of Spielberg's it's, career, probably just in terms of you know, humanizing the, a, the a quintessential yeah. Holocaust movie. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and uh, 
Like Kubrick saw forever, this movie and said, reason, "Oh, I'm not going to make a movie about the Holocaust because he yeah. already made the best that can possibly be made." The, so. the way Schindler's right. List ends is so impactful that it make mm-hmm. like it transcends just making a movie into making a cultural touchstone. Yes. And mm-hmm. I, you know, Absolutely. I, that's why it ranks so highly for me. And I, we were talking about how we were making our lists, and you know, are we ranking our favorites versus the best? I think Schindler's List is the best movie he's made. Uh, it's definitely not the one I would rewatch the most often, not by any no. stretch. But uh, no. you know, it's a movie that everyone should see at least once. Right. And to your point about the ending, like it, it does really kind of get to the heart of like why we tell stories in the first mm-hmm. place, yeah. and like what narrative can do in a culture. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it's it's passing on maybe the most important story, uh, you know, of a lot of our of the 20th century possibly is just, you know, well, and it's, these are people, it, you know, it's getting more, uh, there's fewer and fewer people to tell those stories firsthand anymore. Yes. So having mm-hmm. a movie like Schindler's list and other movies like it, where survivors actually get to share their story is, you know, it's something that's going to be relevant long after Steven Spielberg is dead, long after we're dead, yeah. that these are stories that uh, people will still need to hear and uh, that that's why it's that's why it's number one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you guys both revealed your number one. So I wanted to ask you both what it was. And uh, now you're making me feel bad for not putting Schindler's List as my number one because I put <laughs> that's uh, okay. I, I put the other movie he made that year, which is Jurassic which, Park. Yeah, I was gonna bring that up. Um, Jurassic Park, insane. my number the, three. The fact that <laughs> the the fact that he made those two in the same year, or maybe didn't make them in the same year, but they were released in the same right. year, is um astounding and also kind of like i think the two poles of Spielberg's filmography and yeah. um jurassic park is among my most seen movies in my life like how many times i've watched it and how, how much i know it um and uh it's also one of the i think a lot of people our age grizz we're, we're a couple years older than hugo but i think a lot of people our age point to jurassic park is like the movie that they saw with the, where they said i didn't know movies could do this yeah. I don't know movies could be like this, and um, it's kind of shaped shaped them uh, from that perspective. It's not and, just kids; um, it's the film industry. No, yeah, that saw that movie and said, yeah. "Oh wow, you can do that! Wow, yeah. I'm gonna make the prequels yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna make the prequels." <laughs> well, well, I actually so Hugo was uh, <laughs> horrified that I put The Lost World as my number ten, <laughs> but like, yeah. I ride for the lost world man i mean it's partially influenced by how much i love jurassic park but like <laughs> yeah like the the gymnastic stuff is very grown worthy and everything but like it's also like the closest thing to a horror movie that he's directed i feel like because he didn't uh, direct poltergeist quote unquote but yeah um, maybe jaws there's like a there's like a there's like a horror undercurrent in a lot of his movies whether it yeah. be et or raiders or close encounters like mm-hmm. just a slight slight sp- ticking of a few switches and they become horror movies and like he the makes, lost world is kind of that he makes set pieces that are adventure but have always a little bit of horror in them which adds to the tension mm-hmm. he's very good at tension right maybe. he doesn't make outright horror yes, yes. but he that he's very 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 good at tension and there's but a few Jurassic set, set Park, pieces Jurassic... in the lost world that are really good it's just the overall film i'm like yeah. what? what really <laughs> she kicks but Dr- Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park kind of melds the awe and the horror, yes, and the the tension, but also the you know childlike wonder. Yeah. yeah. Um. I mean, do we want to talk uh, any anything else, or is this uh, a good place to go into what we're the, doing next week? The only thing I'd like to ask you guys is: Are there some things about Spielberg that you don't like? And uh, because I think one of the one of the major criticism that he gets from a lot of critics and fans sometimes is that he uses emotional manipulation too much in his movies and tells you how to feel and i was wondering if you guys think that's a bad thing because i personally think that he's so good at making films that it's not that he tells you how to feel is that he's so good at what he does that you feel what he wants you to feel he's right not i agree with that telling you he he manages to tell you without directly telling you through dialogue yeah, I would say that all storytelling is emotional manip- manipulation. That's yeah. like the point of storytelling. 100%. So to call Spielberg, mm-hmm. yeah, to fault him for that is weird to me. I think you just don't like yeah. movies if that's your critique of Spielberg. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, a lot of, you know, there's there's a sort of group of 
very serious critics that want all films to be very philosophical and ambiguous and don't want uh, well, don't want the audience to necessarily n- know instantly what the film is about but that's not what Spielberg does and it's just a different well, type I mean, of movie I mean watch watch Munich there's a lot of gray st- yeah. areas in yeah. Munich Munich in is an outlier yeah. watch yeah uh Minority Report also I think is kind of a there's some yeah. unanswered questions in that too like there's not just there's some there's plenty of nuance in Spielberg's movies so shut yeah. up those people yes agree I completely agree <laughs> it's just something that I wanted to bring up because it's something that people talk about with him. I mean, as far not. as anything that I don't like about Spielberg, I, I I can't go so far as to say there's anything that I actually dislike about mm-hmm. his movies in general. Uh, at, at most, I the most I could say is sometimes I wish that uh, he'd go a little bit darker. Yeah. Uh, but that's a very you know minor thing in the grand scheme of things, and you know, uh, it's weird because like you know. I, I, I want to sometimes I want Spielberg to go a little darker and then for a lot of other directors I'm like okay rain it rain it back this, give me <laughs> yes, some more lighthearted that, <laughs> it, it's easy to feel that way but um I think it's important to understand that it's not fake it he's not trying to make something that is sentimental he is that way he is a re- I don't know if you've seen interviews of him but he is this bright spark of joy he's a joyous person and he's an emotional person and he puts it in his movies and and, and so it translates that you, way. you also but see in like movies him. he movie movies and tv shows that he produces you can see that mm-hmm. he just likes doing this stuff and yeah that comes across even he like just loves it random things like help. animaniacs you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's produced the transformer movies as well and those are fun they're and they're very successful <laughs> yeah of course they yeah. are i mean definitely okay well so anyway hugo what are we uh, doing so next we have week no final thoughts next week um a film to remember for next week is going to be a film i'd never heard of before i met these guys it was just called rudy and it's a film about american rudy, football is it rudy rudy rudy, 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 rudy. basically rudy. the topic <laughs> it's football season week... guys <laughs> <laughs> the topic for next week is going to be do you have to be a fan of a particular sport to enjoy a movie about that sport and it's going to be really easy to do because I don't understand American sports at all, other than basketball. And so I'm going to watch Rudy and not understand anything that's going on, and we'll see if I enjoy it anyway. See, um, and our our yeah. argument is that you will understand what's going on, at least what's actually so. important to understand. <laughs> I hope so. Your, your homework, your homework for the week, Hugo, is not only watch Rudy but also watch Notre Dame North Carolina on Saturday. Woo! <laughs> I I doubt that's possible. Actually, I. Yeah, Unless you can send him a stream link of some kind, but okay. Well, yeah. So, uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, um, you know, see you next week. <laughs> Bye. Yes, and subscribe and stuff. Oh yes, like, subscribe, and, oh, yeah. and share, <laughs> and, and good, good, good call out, Hugo. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. And-